The W Mass. Yeah, I've been doing that. What is CDF doing? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alice and CMS have lit a fire under us. So we really want to study this. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Hello, yeah. everybody. Today we have uh, the special visitor, Jack Andoy from Japan. And uh, he is going to talk to us about his work on the Atlas experiment, searches for resonances, and his work on the electronics. It's Great. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Um, and I want to tell you a bit about new physics that resonates, both models that have the potential to solve some of the biggest mysteries we have right now in the universe and the standard model, uh, through some motivations that really resonate with me, and which we can see through new mass resonances. And I give an example of uh, event display in data from a search we did looking for three lepton mass resonances, where here you can see two muons in red and an electron with its energy deposits in green. Um, I'll also tell you a bit about the electronics upgrade we're doing, which hopefully doesn't resonate too much and produce too much noise, um, but it will prevent, provide even more potential for discovering some of this rare new physics we're looking at. So let me go back a little bit to before even the Higgs discovery. The Higgs was predicted by the standard model to break the electroweak force into the two that we experienced, electromagnetic and the weak force. And it causes the W and Z bosons that govern the weak force to be quite massive. And this causes the, rain, the uh, force to have very short range, something we don't really experience, much smaller than even the size of the proton. While the electromagnetic force governed by the photon is massless, and that allows us to see the EM field interact over long distances, and we can even see photons through the universe. But the model didn't say much about what the mass of the Higgs boson itself would be. Uh, it allowed that it could be massive and perhaps even preferentially interact with massive particles because it does govern mass. And so this is one of the motivations for building the Large Hadron Collider, which is underneath the border of uh, Switzerland and France. It's a proton, proton accelerator ring, and then it collides them. It's actually built right on top of the SPPS, the Super Proton Antiproton Synchrotron, which was a proton-antiproton collider that discovered the W and Z in the 1980s, and now injects energetic protons into this ring where we can bring them to nearly the speed of light and collide them. And so you see a theme here that discovering these massive particles really requires very high energy accelerators and colliders, but also very high luminosity, where this is just jargon for something that can produce a lot of interesting collisions, a lot of interesting rare events. And we observe these proton collisions with the Atlas detector, this is the one I work on at Penn. It has a sibling experiment, the CMS detector, which Brown was integral in creating and has done a lot of great studies with it. And this is a massive detector, uh, and that's required to detect very large particles. It's about a half a football field in size. You can see the relative size of people here. Uh, you can fit about 200 school buses into the volume. The massive detectors that discover the W and the Z boson, actually, UA1 and UA2, you could fit them inside here 35 times over. And it has to be so large because these are very energetic particles that we need to be able to see over long distances and contain within uh, the volume. But it also has to be highly granular as well in order to have precision physics measurements. And that leads to over 100 million readout channels producing one petabyte of data per second, so a massive operational challenge as well to build and operate this. And with it in LHC and at the CMS experiment, we were able to find a new particle in 2012. And it has all the expected properties of the standard model Higgs boson. As a PhD student, one way I looked for this is through a relatively rare decay of this new particle we created through proton collisions. Decays almost immediately to two Z bosons, which, decay, which themselves decay pretty quickly, almost immediately to two leptons each. And those are what we actually observe, observe. So four lepton final state. We can use special relativity to see the energy and speed and direction of these leptons to calculate the original invariant mass of the Higgs boson. 
And so I'm going to show a video of this four lepton invariant mass distribution as we collected data. And I want you to particularly look around 125 GV, this region here. You'll see as we collect data, we can't say too much. The black is the data, and the mostly red is the standard model background. But we start to see a bit of an excess over time above that non-Higgs expectation. And if we zoom in on this region slightly, we can see that this excess actually agrees pretty well with the expectations for the Higgs boson, shown in blue. So we were able to find it. It lies right here. I just have an example of some particle masses, not all the ones we know, the massless photon, some of the lighter leptons, including the invisible neutrino, which is less than 0.8 EV. We're not sure what the exact mass is as well as the light electron here. And then you go to some of the heavier quarks we have, the B quark at 4.2 GeV, and the most massive particle we know, the top quark, 173. And then some of the heavier bosons are right here, the W and the Z, and the Higgs falls right next to them. And so this completed the standard model. And so we ask ourselves, is that it? Are we done? Or is there evidence for something right around here? right above the scale at which the Higgs breaks the electroweak force into two components, where we can now recover this force, perhaps look for new things. And so today I'm going to start with telling you some of these models and reasons we believe there's physics beyond the standard model that could lead to brand new particles like this. I want to tell you how ATLAS measures particles, particularly the standard model ones produced in the decays, and the consequences on how we can discover new things. And then I want to tell you about one recent search we performed for a new three lepton mass resonance with the Atlas detector. And at the end, I want to tell you a bit about a new charged particle tracker we're building, uh, a lot of it at Penn, which will make it, uh, which will greatly increase our discovery potential, particularly at the high luminosity LHC, to produce new things like this and find them. So first, the motivation for new physics. The standard model doesn't explain dark matter, for instance. We know from astrophysical and cosmological observations that there are a lot of reasons why there should be dark matter. One of the most straightforward ones for me to conceptualize is looking at the rotational speed of stars within a galaxy. We would expect as you go farther away from the center for the speed to decrease because it depends on how much matter there is. And we can see from the disk itself, from the light and from the gas, that the the amount should decrease as we go further out. But that's not what we see. In the end, we see sort of flat velocity, as if there was some halo of matter increasing with radius, dark matter. This could be a new particle that doesn't interact any other way except gravitationally or maybe some other um, much weaker ways. And it could be about an order of TeV of energy. We also know that there's a large amount of matter, uh, antimatter asymmetry in the universe. It's not just, uh, there aren't galaxies of both antimatter and some of matter because we would see their interactions or in the gas in between, and this would produce a lot of light, a lot of photons. And when we look at the universe, we don't see this. So we know our universe must be dominated by matter only, but we don't know how it got there. And there's nothing in the standard model that could predict such a large asymmetry that we see. But it could be something related to how the Higgs breaks the electroweak symmetry, which was very important in the formation of the universe. And there are models that can cause this asymmetry to naturally arise through Higgs electroweak breaking. We also see on Earth-based experiments some stronger than expected interactions between standard model particles. I can give an example of the muon G-2 experiment, which you might have heard of. It's a very beautiful, precise experiment most recently confirmed at Fermilab, the results that were done at Brookhaven in the 90s. But what it basically says is that the interaction between the muon and the photon is stronger than we expect from just standard model processes, which involve its direct interaction and all known processes that can contribute in a loop here and can enhance it. But maybe there's new physics here that could further enhance this and give us the value we see in experiment slightly high. And a lot of evidence points to that being something that should be on order TeV. Any heavier, and it would be too weak to cause this. And finally, the standard model doesn't explain parts of the Higgs boson itself, such as why its mass is so small at only 125 GeV. 
We know its mass is determined by its interactions with many other particles, particularly virtual ones, going down from larger loops all the way down to smaller loops, very high energies, small sizes. And these should continue to contribute to its mass until we reach some scale of new physics where it will stop, which right now is currently just the Planck scale, 10 to 19 GeV mass we should expect, which is extremely high. This is a crazy high mass particularly because what we actually observe is all the way down here with all the other particles. So how could all these mass corrections that should lead it up here ultimately allow the Higgs to be down here? This could happen through cancellation with some new massive particles. Uh, for instance, a scalar particle that has exactly the opposite contribution as the top quark, which is the dominant contribution because it's heaviest. This would very naturally give a mass right near the electroweak scale uh, and could explain the 125 GeV Higgs. And so at the LHC, we're exploring this energy frontier to try and answer questions like this. We look to theorists to help design really elegant replacements or extensions to the standard model. And at the LHC, we have the tools to search for the consequences of these models. And there's quite a few we look at. Today, I'm going to give one example where you can imagine Danny DeVito here as a standard model particle. And he has a twin that's similar in nearly every way, except it's just a bit more massive, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so this model in particular is called supersymmetry. And again, we have the standard model particles. This gets a bit busy, but these are all the known particles in our universe, plus some additional Higgs bosons you can see here, the model predicts. And then for every one of these particles, there's a super partner that's heavier and also a half spin different, but otherwise has the same exact quantum properties. And in addition, this creates, uh, this allows us to create a new quantum number that can sort of govern the interaction between the two of these. We call this multiplicative quantum number R parity. And I show it here. It's just a definition of three other numbers, the baryon number. Uh, this is a quantum number that all quark particles carry the lepton number, which is a quantum number all lepton particles carry, and then also the spin. And looking at this equation, we can see that all standard model particles end up having a value of plus one, while all superpartners have a value of minus one. And so the question becomes, is this a conserved quantity? And I want to give one example of another uh, quantum number, quite similar, the strange number. Strange quarks have a strange number, and through the strong force, it cannot decay into other quarks. A str strange quark will always stay a strange quark. However, there is another force, the weak force, that is much weaker than the strong force, but can violate this and allow the strange quark to decay into an up quark and violate strange number. So are there similar processes that can violate this, or is this a conserved quantity of nature? And if it's conserved, it has a couple interesting properties. One is that superpartners must be produced in pairs. You cannot take a plus one collision here and create just a single minus one. You've now violated this. So you have to produce two, which when they multiply, give you back plus one. And also the lightest superpartners, often these, are stable. This particle cannot decay to just standard model particles. Otherwise, it would violate this again, go from minus one to two plus ones. And so through this model, we have a lot of really elegant solutions that have made this sort of uh, a uh, standing feature of the theory community. One is this lightest neutral superpartner I mentioned is a clear dark matter candidate. This new set of particles can interact with the standard model particles as well as they don't violate, well, often unless they don't violate the uh, R parity number. And this can lead to stronger interactions between the particles we do see, like the muon and the photon, and this can exactly explain the G minus 2 results. <laughs> this can lead the Higgs mass of 125 GeV to be quite natural, again, through these loop corrections from the superpartners that exactly cancel these heavy corrections. And it can also change how the Higgs interacts with itself, which can lead to processes like electroweak baryogenesis, where we can produce more matter early in the universe. And importantly, all of these are compatible with new physics at around a TeV. And some of them would actually prefer new physics around a TeV, particularly these two. So that's the model, and I want to look for it. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is the machine for producing possible TeV scale particles. 
It's broken up into four runs on the schedule. Run one, we discovered the Higgs boson, 2012, at about half the center of mass energy. And run two, from 2015 to 2018, we bumped this up by more than, by about a factor of two to 13 TeV. We're currently in run three, where we're collecting twice the data. And ultimately, we will go to the high luminosity LHC that starts in 2029, and we'll be able to collect 20 times the data. And so I want to tell you a bit about how the LHC collides these protons. They and accelerate them. Each one gets accelerated to 7 TeV, but there's a lot more to a proton than even just the three quark constituents, and these all share in that momentum. So the three valence quarks, the two up and the down, definitely get a good amount of this energy. We can have very high energy collisions. They're a little less interesting because these have a, quite a few different quantum numbers that have to be conserved, so it really constrains what the decay products are based on how they were produced. However, the gluons that keep the protons together and contribute most of the mass of the proton end up carrying about half of this total momentum. And so collisions between the gluons themselves within the proton are a very exciting way we can produce new physics. And in addition, gluons can create quark-antiquark -quark pairs fleetingly, but often enough that we can actually collide the quark-antiquark -quark pairs as well. And if we, for example, collide an up quark and an anti-up quark, that's very clean because we've lost nearly all quantum numbers and we can produce some very interesting things. And so run two, where we have this large step in collision energy, a lot of that gain went to the quarks or the gluons, which carry the largest relative fraction. So it led to a leap in sensitivity for strongly produced new physics through those mechanisms. I like to think two quarks in, two quarks out, or two gluons in, two gluons out. And so this is something I searched for during my PhD, particularly these two quarks because they can't live by themselves in the strong force. They have to quickly hadronize into a spray of particles, stable hadrons. Uh, these are very difficult to measure, but we can. We can look, we can calculate their invariant mass, and we can look for new particles among some smoothly falling background, something like this. Or even look for enhancements in the higher scales up here that could point to new physics out here above the energy that we can't reach, but still which would cause an echo at the energy we're probing. This required a lot of very careful QCD studies, particularly because it's the first time we were at 13 TV, some of the most energetic jets. And I was able to work with a team of about 50 people to calibrate the energy of these objects. And ultimately, I was able to lead the group uh, in creating the final calibrations. But I don't want to go into details for this today. I do just want to use this to say what kind of physics we can look for next. The strong superpartners, Susie's superpartners here, have to be produced through gluon collisions because there's they, they don't carry charge, um, but they interact strongly with the gluon, so this is the dominant way. And because we have lots of these gluon collisions, we can produce lots of these strong superpartners. And so run two, we were able to do great searches and really extend our sensitivity, but unfortunately we didn't see these below one TeV. But it is much rarer to produce electroweak superpartners because we can't produce them through these gluon collisions that are more common. That's because they need to have a quark-antiquark pair to create an electroweak boson, which they can then interact with. And so this is a much rarer process, and so we have weaker constraints. Sometimes we've only been able to search for these up to 100 GeV or a little more than that. And it really benefits from a lot more data as well. If processes like this benefit from the higher center of mass energy, the rarer processes like this benefit relatively much more from getting more data, which make RUN3 and the HLLHC much more exciting. So today we're going to look for the boson superpartners in particular, the charge versions, the charginos we call them, and the neutral versions, the neutralinos. And we look at these with the ATLAS detector, which detects these energetic particles, the collisions happening right in the middle. There are a couple of different technology layers I want to talk about, the charged particle trackers, one which sits in the middle, and also one for muons, which is on the outside, because muons will generally go right through the rest of our detector. And then the calorimeters, which sit uh, in between the two and really try to stop all other particles from continuing and measure their energy. So tracking subdetectors trace the path of a charged particle through the different tracking layers in a magnetic field. And the amount it bends can tell us how fast it's moving, or in reality, how much momentum it has. 
And the key point here is that the measurement resolution worsens with increasing momentum. If it's a low momentum particle that curves a lot, we can really measure that curvature well, and we can get a pretty accurate uh, measurement resolution of it, like you can see here for one GeV particle. However, if it's extremely energetic, it will burst through our detector, look almost like a straight line, and it's really hard to measure the curvature of a straight line. And so it gets quite a bit worse, maybe about 50% for a 1,000 GeV particle. So this really lets us look pretty accurately at particles like electrons and muons, particularly at low energies. The second type are calorimeters, and I want to briefly get into uh, the physics of this a bit. It's made up of alternating layers of absorber material and active material. The absorber material try and force interactions of these particles to cause it to break up and to shower. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see in, uh, neutral particles such as neutrons because the active material then samples the particle shower and particularly the charged aspect of it to measure the energy. And we can continue this. You can see the particle shower as it interacts and creates more particles and then we measure them. And by seeing the relative, the amount of energy we, we measured, we can, it's proportional to the energy of the original particle and we can calibrate to that. The key point here is that the measurement resolution improves with increasing energy. And this is because there, there are several effects, but two main ones I want to point to here in the energy resolution. There's a constant term which just has to do with how well we created the detector, how uniform it is or not uniform the materials are. And the second one, which is the randomness of the showering, whether a particle we created happened to deposit energy in the absorber material we don't see, or happened to put it in the active material. And this decreases with energy as the shower becomes larger and many more particles, and therefore becomes much more statistically similar. So all showers sort of become similar, and this term sort of goes to zero, and we're stuck with just the constant term. And there are two types of showers I want to talk about. The first is the electromagnetic shower. These are some of the easiest ones to see because it's really just two particles. An electron, which will cool and scatter off a nuclei to create a Bremsstrahlung radiation, which is just a continual radiation of photons. And the photons will also interact and primarily pair produce to an electron and a positron, which will then continue on. And it's really just those two types of particles, and they deposit very relatively little energy to the nuclei. We get to see a lot of that energy. And so you can see at low energies, it's an okay resolution, about 10% in the measurement. But at high energies, 1,000 GeV, we can do a percent. We can do a very good energy measurement. So opposite of the tracker. Hadronic showers are quite a bit messier. Here we need to force nuclear interactions uh, with the nucleus, which the fragment can gain energy and thermalize. We produce fission, which will free, the, free neutrons and protons and cost energy that we can't observe. We can create other short-lived hadronic combinations of quarks that can interact with our detectors different ways. Particularly, some of these can decay electromagnetically into photons. And therefore, hadronic showers are not just hadronic showers, they're also electromagnetic showers. And both types have different responses, and it's very hard to disentangle them. So therefore, a hadronic calorimeter resolution is quite a bit worse, 50% at low energies, 6% at high energies. And the last point I want to sneak in, looking down the beam line, if you can see that this is our detector, and I just show the energy deposits, you don't see any of the infrastructure. But the conservation of momentum tells us that in this transverse plane, all particles must balance. So here again, I have the two muons of the electron, which you can see really focused energy in this direction. So it tells us there might have been an invisible particle we didn't see in the other direction. Gives us this momentum balance. So that's sort of how we infer invisible particles. And so I want to put all these pieces together, particularly towards the Higgs discovery with Atlas. The Higgs prefers to decay to 2B quarks, which again are dominated by that larger resolution uncertainty. And so even though that's the dominant way we produce it most of the time that way, it did not contribute at all to the Higgs discovery in 2012. It was the much rarer processes like di photons, which only have 0.2% of the time, but was a 2.5 sigma uh, influence on the measurement, so only about 0.6% chance that it, it wasn't the Higgs boson doing that. And the even rarer process, two Zs to four leptons, only happens one out of 10,000 of the decays, and yet that was even stronger. And that's a combination of two effects. One is the resolution. The poor resolution of the B-jet energies means when we try and reconstruct their mass, it's quite broad and much harder to see. 
Whereas for two photons and similar for the four leptons, we get a nice narrow peak. And this is particularly important when you have a large background. And you can see that nice peak from the diphoton stuck out like a sore thumb and we could see it. The two B quarks blended in with the background and wasn't something we could observe. And so that's one aspect. Z to 4L not only has that great resolution, it also has a small background down here, not this big one. That made it even easier to see. And that's why we call it the golden channel. And so in searching for new resonances, can we exploit golden decays, particularly to leptons? And in the future, can we improve the hadronic resolution to do more with these exciting events that really dominate most of the Higgs we produce? And so that gets me to these new leptonic mass resonances we searched for. Uh, we had a couple recent results come out. Here's one instance for if R parity is conserved, this quantity. That means, again, these superpartners have to be created in pairs, and the lightest one is invisible. It will not decay. We will not see it. And so we can search for things like this, which is the flat, one of the flagship SUSY signatures, where we have two of these particles decaying to a W and a Z boson, each decaying lepto leptonically, again, these golden channels. So we get three leptons total, an invisible neutrino, and two other invisible particles. And this was a search I led recently with an international team from Penn, Nikef, Sussex, Adelaide, Oslo, and CERN. And it was really tough, not only because we have invisible particles, how do you see a mass resonance and reconstruct a mass resonance when a lot of the energy is invisible? And particularly because the phase space we were most interested in is when there was a small mass splitting, and this was a very low energy boson produced, and therefore very low energy leptons. And that's extremely hard for us to see at a hadron collider. We're not good at that. We love the high energy stuff. We're tough at the low energy. But we were able to do a number of things to really even get us down to 3 GeV, a lot of tough backgrounds. But I don't want to go into details for this today. I want to talk about a different search where our parity could be violated. And this was a collaboration with theorists who developed the model at Penn, string theorists, including Bert, Sebastian, and Austin, who found this model of string theory that when you run down, creates SUSY with a couple of minimal additions. One is this B minus lepton symmetry, which is an observed symmetry of the standard model. It's accidental. Uh, there's nothing purposeful that causes it, but it's one thing we see in the standard model. It elevates this to an explicit symmetry. It has its own symmetric group and is defined as a real symmetry of nature now. However, it also introduces three right-handed neutrinos, something not necessarily predicted by the standard model, uh, but something we've been looking for a while. They're very sterile because they don't interact with the weak force. Only left-handed particles do. So they're really tough to see. But as a consequence, these three right-handed neutrinos have superpartners with a charge under this. They're leptons, so they have a leptonic charge. They're charged under this field, but nothing else in the standard model. So we, when we run down to our energies, these break this. Just like the Higgs broke the electroweak symmetry, these right-handed neutrinos break this symmetry. And it doesn't break any other symmetry of the standard model because they're neutral under that. And that can lead to small R parity violating terms that violate lepton number only. So for instance here, now you can have one of these lightest particles decaying to a boson and a lepton. This quantum number is no longer conserved and lepton number isn't conserved as well. And so this is where I as an experimentalist really was able to come in. Not only the fact that we wanted to look for things like this because we can produce them at the LHC now, but because I had all this experience with the Z boson from the Higgs to ZZ to 4 lepton. I knew leptons are golden channel objects and that if this decayed to two leptons, we could get a three lepton resonance. And this was actually uncovered at the time. And it's not just supersymmetric models that could predict this. Um, type three seesaw models that explain the lightness of the neutrino due to a much heavier partner lepton could decay the same way to a Z and a lepton. And so as an experimentalist, that excited me because it was a brand new final state to look for. A lot of models could predict it. You know, how do we start? And so we started crunching the numbers, and this was a team of just experimentalists at Penn, uh, my advisor Evelyn Thompson, and then three graduate students, Lee, Ian, and Lucas. Um, and we say this is a very rare process, much rarer to produce than even the Higgs boson. Only about 1,900 events would be produced if this was a 700 GeV mass particle. We don't know how often it will decay to this Z boson. Again, it can also decay to a Higgs and a W, but we were really focused on the Z. 
So we'd get some hit to the number of events based on what this branching fraction is, which we can't know ahead of time. But we do know z's decay to the two leptons we want to look for, electrons and muons, only 7% of the time. So if we require one of these sides to decay that way, already we're at 260 events. And this is generally pair produced is the most common way we'd see this. And if we require the other leg to also go to a three lepton resonance, we only have nine events. This would be a very hard thing to see, particularly if this is anything but 100% branching fractions. So we said, okay, let's just only require one leg to go to a three lepton resonance. Now we have what we're looking for, but we can also do some model specific search regions here to take our 260 events and do something else with them. So we broadly, even though this has hundreds of different ways it can decay, we broadly split this up into three types of decays. One, for example, to a Z that decays hadronically in a neutrino, so there's no other lepton. This is what you would think of as a three lepton resonance search bread and butter region. This was one of our regions. Another was if we get an additional lepton, for instance, if we have a W decaying to a lepton neutrino, but we still have some missing energy from neutrino particles. Again, missing energy is something we can't directly see. We have to infer it, so it's a bit tougher. So this can define a four lepton region with some missing energy. And finally, my favorite is as if this decay is fully visible. For instance, a Higgs decaying to two Bs, which it loves to do. An additional lepton, there's nothing invisible here. We can reconstruct all these particles the boson parent masses, and even the superpartner masses, which is extremely part, uh, powerful because nothing else in the standard model should be able to pair these particles back to two mass resonances. There's quite a lot we produce that creates these particles. For instance, TTZ is one of our major backgrounds where top can decay to a B and a lepton neutrino. Don't see the neutrinos. And the Z can decay to two leptons. So we get four leptons. We get two B quarks. That's all we see in the event same particles as this. However, they would reconstruct three different mass particles, not two. And so we can reconstruct the two and use the asymmetry between the mass to reject non-resonant backgrounds like this, which ended up being extremely powerful. And here I'll show you in that region, the fully reconstructed, the invariant mass distribution of the search. So here we have variable binnings. At the lowest, these are about 20 GeV wide. You can see a 20 GeV resonance here. And they get quite large as you go up, at the highest around 140 GeV, because this is both related to the width of the signal we're looking for, but also the amount of background events we have, which is a very important consideration. So this variable binning, and on the y-axis you can see the yield of events we got normalized to the width of the bin so that you can see this nice smoothly falling distribution, otherwise it would look choppy as the bin sizes change. We have our major backgrounds in the colors, two of them. This is log Y, so it doesn't look as major as it is, but this blue, the ZZ, is actually a substantial fraction of the background, as well as TTZ is quite large. And then a few others, including triboson, which in the four lepton region we were surprisingly sensitive to, even though this isn't a process that had been observed at the time. You can see different signal models with certain uh, assumptions on the branching fractions, so these can be a, quite a bit lower as well. But you can see how well they're peaked in the bin relevant to their mass. And there's just some small tails, primarily from incorrect combinations of these particles. But it turned out to be a very powerful way to see in, this, in these mass distribution, these particles. And then you can see data. Unfortunately, we don't have too many excesses, and the small excesses we have are very insignificant. This uh, bottom panel shows the data Monte Carlo differences of the significance given all the uncertainties. So you can see at most a little less than two sigma, which is something we see all the time. So unfortunately, no three lepton mass resonance, but we can make a roadmap for future searches, say what we would have been sensitive to and where we can look next. And so this plot shows the mass of the produced superpartners on the x-axis and the branching fraction to the z boson on the y-axis, because that's what we cared most about to get this three lepton resonance. So you can see if it decays to uh, Z 100% of the time, we would have been very sensitive, almost out to a TeV, which is almost unheard of for some of these um, Higgs super, partner, uh, super partners. But if we go lower in branching fractions, we get less of those nice clean resonances. And so at 450 GeV we, uh, is our limit for 5% decays, quite a bit worse. And so there is a bit of region here, you can see, where if a Higgs or W boson happened to be preferred, we might not have seen it. And so it begs the question, what if it was? And so we went back to the theorists we were collaborating with closely. We said, we really want to see the breakdown of all these different models. If you run them down, 
how often do you see a branching fraction to z high? How often do you see Higgs high? And we were able to see that about three quarters of the models have z branching fraction less than 10%. So quite a few models we would have seen, we could exclude, but a number of them maybe we couldn't have, but they do prefer decays to the Higgs in those instances, more than 70%. So theory hints at a preference for something that looks like this, where we get a lepton and then a Higgs decay. And this is also uncovered. We're often looking a lot for two Higgs as well. Maybe we're starting to look for additional particles, but we typically don't look for leptons and we definitely don't try and reconstruct their masses. And this is something uncovered now. Higgs to 4b is 34% of the decays, and this is so rare that you would need that b final state. And so it will require precise b jet measurements, which I showed you before, really reduced our ability to reconstruct this. And this is something I did work on in run two. I did some calibrations that used the shape of how these B corks shower through our calorimeter and differences we expect in flavors between how a gluon responds or a light quark responds or a B jet responds in order to improve these resolutions by about 20% or more. And I'm currently pursuing a new neural network technique that will allow us to more fully utilize all the information in our detector, all the energy deposits, et cetera, with undergraduate Garrett at Penn and some of my colleagues. So hopefully it'll make things like this uh, much more sensitive to new physics. It will also improve some other future measurements uh, that I think are quite exciting, particularly at the HLLHC, where we're going to have about 20 times the data. And one of these searches is for rare di-Higgs production that can probe the self-coupling of the Higgs. This is one of the only standard model parameters that we have not yet measured. And this is the likelihood for Higgs, which is produced in this manner, to decay into two Higgs and interact with itself through some coupling here. Again, this is going to be very rare. Uh, the cross section is 30 femtobarns, so we only produce, um, you know, every femtobarn of data, we only produce 30 of these. So we're only going to get in each channel a few thousand of them, you know, some hundred thousand total, but a few thousand in each channel. And the strongest search channels are therefore going to be the ones where we have a Higgs decaying to B because we have that branching fraction. However, there is a small wrinkle in this in that there are other processes known in the standard model that can create two Higgs, particularly this way. Before, we created a single Higgs through a three top quarks. Here, we can do a four top quark loop and produce them separately from these couplings because the Higgs loves to couple to the top quark. And this becomes quite dominant when these tops are on shell, when we create them on their mass, which is 172 GeV. So in general, 350 GeV of energy, this is dominant. This only becomes important when you're above the mass of the Higgs, so 125 each, that's 250, so above 250. So between 250 and 350, we have a narrow window where this is one of the most, uh, most dominant productions of two Higgs, and we're most sensitive to this coupling. However, that region leads to very soft B jets. And currently, our, our estimation of this with the full high luminosity data set is we can only limit this value of the coupling from between 0 to 2.7 of the standard model. So 270% higher or 100% lower, which is good because it could exclude a lot of new physics that contributes to this even more so, but it leaves a lot of room for new physics that we wouldn't see. And so jet studies now for the high luminosity LHC are important to really improve our energy resolution and get those softer jets and also put them in the trigger so we can make sure we save them when we have the chance, because we're only going to get this data once over the 10 years. Once you have it, have it, you have it. And so getting in the trigger is important. And so that brings me to the high luminosity LHC and some of the things we can do to improve our chances of seeing new physics like this, particularly these three new sub-detectors we're installing, brand new detectors. Two of them are trackers, one in the middle, in the closest region, the pixel tracker, which is very fine granularity, and the strip tracker, which is a much larger area silicon tracker, as well as a forward timing detector that will give us about 50 picosecond resolution on the timing of when a particle came and allow us to separate from the many other collisions we're creating. But there are going to be a lot of challenges. We're going to have a very high radiation environment between 0.6 to 1.7 gigarad, depending on the type of detector technology. Our current tracker could not survive this and it would fall apart. We want to read out the data much more quickly in order to save much more of this interesting data we're getting. So about 10 times faster than we can do now with the current tracker 
about one megahertz. And we also want to get improved physics performance, not only looking more forward to collect a lot more events, but being able to separate with that terrible pileup uh, problem we have. And so the one I want to focus on today is the silicon strip tracker, this outside one. Uh, here at Brown, for the CMS, you actually make the sibling version of this for the CMS detector, which is similar in many ways. And for us, it has a huge area, 165 meter square silicon sensors, read out by 60 million readout channels, nearly the total readout channels of the current Atlas detector itself. And we have to read these out with 300,000 application-specific integrated circuits, custom microelectronics we make to read these out. And I show a picture of one of these staves that are going to be inserted right here. You can see the, these blue uh, horizontal lines. Composed of some of these electronics, and this is at Brookhaven National Lab where we do a lot of the construction. And I'm going to zoom in on one of these to show you some of the components. The silicon strips down here are sensitive to charged particles passing through and will send a signal, which is read out by these Atlas binary chips shown in yellow. You can see quite a few of these bonded to silicon strips. These digitize and compress the data from up to 256 different strips and sends them out. We then have the hybrid controller chip, which handles the data for up to 11 of these at a time. There's only 10 in this instance. It can make sure there aren't too many data requests coming. It can protect the ABCs. It can configure them. And it will also serialize all the data coming from them extremely quickly at 640 megabits per second, a very fast rate, and send it off the detector. We also have a third chip, the autonomous monitoring and control. And this looks at all the voltages, currents, temperatures on the board, and checks that nothing goes in a dangerous range. And if it does, it shuts the whole system down immediately. Because once these are installed, we can't go in to fix them. We can't go in to replace them. If something dies, it's dead for the rest of the HLLHC. So we need to make sure they're protected and will work. And so this hybrid controller chip and AMAC chip were designed and tested at UPenn. We were able to achieve production-ready versions of this, uh, of a version of this in just two different versions. The V0 we produced in 2018, and the V1 we produced in 2021. And we were able to do this thanks to simulations, where we check that everything's working uh, in a simulation, in a computer, uh, before we actually produce it, which is a very expensive process, a uh, very time-consuming process. And so we were able to build a framework that simulated all three ASICs together, as well as their interactions, to check for problems in the communication. This interfaces to industry simulator tools. And usually, most engineers will code their verification tests within the industry simulator tools. But this can be a bit tough. This is a low-level design language meant to describe how electronics work, not necessarily meant to describe tests or how physics will work or how the LHC will work or how particles will interact. And so at Penn, we adopted actually a fairly unique approach, which was to take this Python-based interface. This was an open source project called CoCoTV, uh, Coroutine Co-Simulation Test Bench. And it has, at the time, it was sort of abandoned. It's actually now been um, adopted by some open uh, software foundations that are breathing new life into it. But we were able to use this as an interface to allow us to develop our tests in Python, You know, something I myself am quite familiar with, less so with these industry simulator tools. So this allowed for immediate impacts by physicists and students to contribute to this project in a meaningful way right away. It allowed for much closer collaboration between physicists and engineers, which allowed me to be involved in the process and use my physics knowledge of how we're actually going to operate the detector to even give feedback on how some of the resets should work, for instance, uh, when we're actually operating it. And it also facilitated some really difficult tests that would have been prohibitively difficult to do in this lower level design language. But with Python and its extensive ecosystem, we were able to do pretty uh, advanced tests. And so I want to walk you through an example of that. You know, Here is the product we've since made, this module. But at the time, each of these chips were sort of just a design and idea. And we could connect them in simulation and see how they worked. I could play the part of the detector operator sending triggers at any rate I wanted, normally 1 megahertz. But I could randomize this based on our expectations of how it should be randomized. 
I could even scan these rates to find at which point it stops working, what's our maximum operating rate, and make sure it was sufficiently far away from what we expect. And I could follow these triggers through, and I could look at them in the HCC, which again, cues the triggers and buffers to protect the rest of the ABCs. It only sends out a few at a time to all the ABCs. I could see that it was doing that correctly. And I could see this trigger cue rise and fall at an expected level. I could also play the role of the LHC. And here's my poor cartoon of bunches of protons being collided into many particles. But these leave hits in the silicon that are seen by the ABCs. And we had simulations from the, of the high luminosity LHC of how many charged particles we expect throughout the detector, and therefore the rate of hits we expect. And so I could use this randomized rate. You can say maybe this ABC got zero, this event, this one got four. And I could place them instantaneously just for tens of nanoseconds and see the system pick up those hits, process them, and send them back to the HCC. I could then follow it through and check that the return data match expectation exactly every time. Even though I threw different data every single event, I could cross-check that exactly because Python really made that easy to do. I could also simulate the train structure of the LHC itself. Not that just we have one collision, but we have collisions every 25 nanoseconds and what that spacing looks like. I could put in the gap we have between protons, we call it the abort gap, a much longer space. And I can watch the system recover during that abort gap before we get more events later on. And I could also simulate the unexpected, things that are outside of the operational parameters, such as noise bursts. What if we happen to have a mistake and send way too many triggers to these things? How will they behave? It'll send too many to the HCC, the, to the ABCs, the trigger cues will fill up, and at some point it will reach its maximum. What will happen then? Or what if one ABC has a hot spot? Something goes wrong with the voltage source uh, and it produces way too many hits, you know, 30 every event instead of just the three or two on average we expect. Then it'll send way too much data to the HCC, too much to process, and it could slow the whole thing down. What would happen then? And the best part is while doing this, I could look at it all, the internals of the chip, and I could plot it all because Python and Root made that very easy. And my data analysis background allowed me to do things like this, which is an example of a noise burst. And I'm going to annotate it a bit to make a little more sense. Here on the x-axis is the time simulated. And each dot is a different request for data we sent, a different trigger. And during regular operation, the y-axis shows how long it had to wait, how many other triggers it was behind in line. And you can see it was empty, so each of these triggers were processed very quickly. Sometimes if we had two randomly near one another, because these are very realistic simulations, it would go up a bit, but we could handle it. But then I threw a noise burst of ABCs. For about 0.2 milliseconds, they sent way too many clusters. And it took a while for the system to process, the ABCs to process, and then the HCC. And I could watch the amount of time each trigger had to wait increased and increased as the queue was filling and filling to the point that it was completely filled. And we had to start throwing away triggers. And okay, that's fine. You know, we cannot handle the situation. If it throws away triggers, it's good to know which ones it throws away and that's working. But most importantly, does it lock up? Does something go wrong here that stops regular uh, operation? Because then we have to do uh, an intervention. We'll lose much more data and we only want to do so many interventions and we have a lot of these, hundreds of thousands of these, we have to operate. Thankfully, by the end of it, once we worked out all the kinks, we could see, no, it will just naturally recover. It might take some time, but we'll naturally get to the point during regular operation where the chip works. So this is just an example of some of the powerful things we were able to do, not only with simulations, but also using a Python-based interface to plot and really understand what was happening. And we use these to also simulate radiation effects. The first chip we created we found had a problem in that it was difficult to operate under radiation. We had a lot of protons or heavy ions and beams that were depositing a lot of charge in the electronics, and it can lead to voltage spikes that could get caught on and change the logic, or the amount of energy it deposits could just flip the logic itself. A one could become a zero, a zero could become a one. Data could be wrong, or the logic we used to configure this to provide the instructions for what to do could just change. And so V1 introduced new predictions, de-glitchers, which means we only consider a voltage level to have changed from low to high if it's lasted for a while, not just a temporary voltage spike. Or triplication of the logic. 
if we have one piece of logic interrupted and flipped, it's okay because we have two other identical copies. And by looking at all three of them, we know, no, these two show the right answer and we can correct the affected logic. And so it required some trade-offs, particularly an increase in size. You can see going from V0 to V1, a larger footprint. Some of the memories, like the SRAMs here, had to be removed for smaller FIFOs just to be able to fit it, which in the end ended up being a blessing for us because we learned that these actually aren't operating as ideally as we would like. So it's great that we don't have them. But we were able to simulate, did the protections we work in this brand new design still work? And so we simulated the test. We flipped to logic using this Python-based interface, something that was very easy for us to do. And we did this extremely fast. We got maps of all the logic, and we randomly chose the ones to flip. And we could do this at a rate 1 billion times faster than at the HLLHC, almost as fast as we could flip the logic. And by the end of it, we could prove that the, all the protections we uh, put in worked, and the verification was successful, and the V1 was the production chip. And of course, we actually have to test that it worked with in reality. Um, so we tested these with particle beams in 2022 at two places, one heavier ions that will deposit more energy at Levant in Belgium, and then protons at the Triumph Synchrotron in Canada. And here you can see our boards, some readout cables, pressed as closely as you can get to this proton source, which is usually used for proton therapy. So the person sits way out here, but we really wanted as high affluence as possible. And it also led to round-the-clock shifts. Here you can see two of the students, Andy and Bobby, uh, and myself working late at night. When you're this deep underground, it's hard to tell when it's day and when it's night. Um, but it's a really fun experience to be able to build these things yourselves and operate all aspects of it, sort of like doing the LHC yourself on a smaller project. But one point is that beam access time is very short, only a few days, and it's very expensive. So you need to make sure these things are working right away at showtime. And so I built a data acquisition framework that would operate continuously, not just you know a few hours and then seg fault, as was typical, unfortunately, for some of the testing we were doing before, but that could operate over days at a time stably. And rapidly, reading these out as faster than had ever been read out yet with a real chip. Because as we have a radiation effects, we want to see individual radiation effects and write them down. If we have multiple radiation effects, we're not going to be able to get a correct amount of statistics. And I even implemented automated error catching and recovery that were informed by simulations. All those problems I was able to simulate and what the data looked like when it came back to me, I already had that knowledge. So with a real system, I could do that. And I could turn triplication off in the chip, which is a nice feature we added. And I could see all the errors, all the bad data start to come, but the system was able to catch that automatically, quickly reset it, and we could operate. Not too stably, you know, it's a good thing we had all this triplication in. It would have been a pain to do this for, 100,000 chips, but we were able to do it. And so I just show the results of the irradiation, one example. Another nice feature of these chips is that that triplicated logic that's self-protecting, it's also self-reporting. So if one of them changes logic and goes wrong, it will report it, and we can read that, and we can get a rate. And again, these aren't uh, S, uh, effects, call them single event effects. These aren't irradiation effects that would cause a problem because they're corrected but we can start to see the cross-section uh, and make sure that our chip is experiencing these radiation effects. And so that's what I show here. On the y-axis is the cross-section for a bit to be flipped. You know, the higher rate of protons we send times this will give us the total number of bit flips we expect. And this is for heavy ions, so on the x-axis is the linear energy transferred by a heavy ion. The heavier the ion, the more energy and more charge it will transfer into the electronics the more likely it will flip. And so you can go see going from neon to xenon, the rate increases quite a bit. And it has this fast increasing and then plateau, which is um, a well-known shape of radiation effects. So that also gives us confidence that we're actually looking at radiation effects. Ultimately, we saw very good agreement. You can see here between the HCC star, which is in purple, and the AMAC star, which is in orange factor of two difference, which agrees very well with our uncertainties on the beam parameter. You can only know the beam so well. And also we had a very good agreement between this and protons, if we were to extrapolate this down to the cross-section of protons uh, from the independent ones at Triumph, we also saw a factor of two, which is great. And even better, the predictions I made from the simulation, which are some of the hardest calculations I've ever made, agreed within a order of magnitude, a factor of 10, uh, the amount of flips we would get here. 
which means at the LHC, we're going to operate very well at the general LHC, just like we expect. So the ASICs were a success. The design is one of the toughest parts of building a detector, and the simulations were critical for doing so. They ensured a working radiation hard design, uh, gave accurate predictions of the performance of these chips in actual operation, and minimized the number of expensive production and testing cycles. And so they're ready for production, but that's just the start. Next, we actually have to use these, and that's half the battle. We have to build data acquisition systems that run at rate and that will run the actual detector. This is both as we construct and test these things in the next three years, as we ship them over to CERN and commission them for three years, and then actually during operation, starting in 2029. And we can also take a lot of what we learn to lead future efforts to develop, simulate, and test new electronics for future detectors where we're going to want even faster electronics with even lower latency, even more complex with artificial intelligence on it, machine learning, compression, et cetera, and they can benefit from these tools. And so to wrap up, I just want to say about future colliders uh, that I mentioned, these detectors that this would be applicable for. Uh, we're starting to explore the opportunities in the future for these through the SNOMAS and P5 process. This is where the whole high energy community gets together and says what we want to do for the next decade. And there are a number of exciting collider opportunities. There's a Hadron Collider we could do around 100 TeV, even bigger than the LHC. You can see how large this ring would be uh, next to the LHC. Um, but that would greatly extend our physics reach to, to exciting new particles. Electron-positron colliders, which give a much cleaner environment and can allow us to produce the Higgs in a much higher quantity in a much cleaner conditions than we do now. So in many ways, a Higgs factory. But it's also very good for some of those electroweakly produced searches because particularly the soft material, we don't have to worry about pileup. So it's also very powerful for those well-motivated models. And also brand new technologies like the Cool Copper Collider. This is just a new way designed using supercomputers to figure out what's the best way to create acceleration techniques in electron positron, positron collider, which the US developed to allow us to do it in a much smaller space. Or even muon colliders, something we haven't done before. But we now have shown that we can keep these alive long enough and probably accelerate them to allow for amazing clean collisions, though we will have quite a bit of background at the edges. You can see in this, this mock-up of a detector how much radiation goes to the side because these muons are decaying in flight. They're not stable particles. But there's a lot of opportunities to lead efforts on readout electronics for these and explore detector innovations needed to uh, reach the physics goals we have. And my last slide of substance is one part of this I'm particularly excited for, future calorimeters. Um, these are really at the detector frontier in terms of the timing we use to read these out, the granularity. This is something CMS is pioneering right now with a very high granularity <laughs> calorimeter that you're building right now. More uniformity to give us that better resolution I mentioned, but also new dimensions of information that we could extract. And I give one example of a technology that's been sort of resurrected recently with the rise of silicon photomultipliers, but they will read out the calorimeters. The ones I mentioned that we use in Atlas are scintillating fibers to measure the energy. And that measures the energy of electromagnetic and hadronic particles together. And we have the absorbers, absorbers which break up the material. But we could add a second type of particle, a Sherenkov fiber that's only sensitive to relativistic, very fast particles going through it and produce photons only to those. The slower hadronic particles would not leave uh, energy deposit here. And so therefore we have a way to read out only the EM component and we can therefore infer the hadronic component and separate the two which have different responses. And that can take our resolutions down from about 50% now and have it to 25% at 1 GeV. It can even allow us to go to lower energies at high, uh, lower resolutions at high energies, 6% down to about 1%. And so there's a number of ways we can start looking into using this, including if we just have a long segment of these materials, can we in introduce granularity into this? Return that back to see the shape of the shower, see where the particles interacted, which help us calibrate the energy. We can use timing. We can read out this side and this side and use precise timing difference between photons. For instance, if one is produced here, we should get the signal here. So if we can get 50 picosecond readout, we can really start to distinguish where it came from. Or we can use exciting new materials that are really being used a lot uh, in condensed matter applications, such as quantum dots. 
These are wave shifters that will read in UV light, which is something we produce through these materials. But you can tune the output wavelength. For instance, we can do bluer light here or redder light here. And then based on the wavelength of that light you see, you can figure out where the, the signal was and introduce this continual longitudinal structure without breaking this up into actual different pieces. So there's a lot of great potential here, but still a lot of challenges, making sure we get enough light yield to actually be able to uh, measure this over time, make sure it's radiation hard, that the light yield doesn't decrease as we radiate these materials, ensure the radiate, uh, readout electronics can handle all these channels. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential here for the future. So just to conclude, there's a lot of exciting physics we're doing now in RUN3 and the HLHC, particularly new, challenging, electroweakly produced resonances, and also measurements of the Higgs self-interaction, particularly through Higgs to 2b quarks, which will be challenging because of its jet energy calibration, but I think we can do a bit better on the resolution, particularly with the pileup at the HLHC. And then I also talked a bit about particle detectors, how important readout electronics are for the HLHC, and the next steps include system commissioning, testing, uh, construction testing, and commissioning operation at CERN, and then some new R&D ideas. And I'll leave you with this beautiful picture I took in the dark of one of these wafers of silicon chips uh, we have before we cut these up. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jeff. So we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, it was really impressive. Uh, thank you for the talk, and um, especially with the, the improvement on the, uh, the tracker uh, aspect. But I'm actually curious about the, the most recent thing that you mentioned with the quantum dots. Uh, what what are these uh, technologies for the calorimetry? Are you actually like doing R and D on currently? Have you actually tried applying any quantum dots to these uh, fibers? No, I haven't. So there's been a lot of research in the past into this, and it's been resurrected, like I said, because we we can do a lot more with this. And quantum dots have a lot of research for other applications. And so they're easy to mass produce now. You can make them by the tons, literally. Uh, even virally, we can grow these through viruses, weird things like that. But they haven't been connected in this way before uh, to see that we can do it. And it seems fairly straightforward. Again, it just requires us to understand, really, do we get enough light? Is there enough separation between the wavelengths? Can we get it accurate enough? Is there enough light that we can actually start to distinguish these? Can the electronics have enough channels and uh, split this light in a way that we can read it accurately? And what's the radiation effect? We're quite unique, you know, us and maybe NASA in, in how much we stress about radiation. Uh, and so that's one thing we'd really have to study. Oh, can I have a follow-up? Follow-up? Sure. Yeah, just because I was, I was yeah. uh, So you're saying... Um, NASA is already using these in applications? No, 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 no. I'm saying oh, oh, NASA cares about yeah, radiation. We job. care about radiation. Maybe so, nowadays smart driving cars care because even the slightest flip and you might crash your car. But yeah. So are there any experiments that do involve radiation environments that are using quantum dots and then seeing how the radiation affects damages? I'm not aware of them. There's a lot of use in using these as very sensitive photon detectors or particle detectors, particularly when it comes to dark matter types of applications. Um, and so in the high energy community, there is starting to get a lot of experience here, but that's not a high radiation environment. Thank you. Yeah, a very interesting talk. A couple of questions. Uh, one is, um, how do you or your vendor make the chips uh, radiation hard? And the second question is, when you design the ASIC, do you design from scratch or use uh, uh, the gate array method from the industry, use their, you know, just cut paste there some of the component already. Sure. What does the uh, ASIC consist of? I mean, what kind of electronics component do you have inside? Sure. Um, so the first question was radiation hardness. The radiation uh, hardness. So a lot of this is on the logic saying we're going to have effects from radiation in the logic flipping states. And for that, how do we correct them? Not prevent them from happening, how do we correct them? And there are other radiation effects, like ionizing radiation. This is something I didn't go into, um, something I studied uh, quite extensively at Brookhaven. Uh, and here I just show a plot. The fact that as you ionize these with more and more photons, gamma radiation, the current used increases. And so actually the analog features of these chips change. And so they take a lot more power uh, to run it because there's this leakage current that we usually have, but it's been accentuated. And this is also a problem not only because it takes more power, and right now in Europe, 
energy is a hot topic. We actually shut down the LHC a little sooner than we expected to save energy. But because this can produce heat that will warp a precision tracker, which is very dangerous and something we ran into the past. And so for things like this, we can use different materials or different sizes. Going to smaller sizes can sometimes help. We printed in 130 nanometer. We were thinking about going to 35 nanometer. We didn't need to. Right now, CERN's really exploring something like 25 nanometer, maybe 28 nanometer, and how radiation hard that logic is to analog effects like this. We're also cheating a little bit, and we're just going to pre-irradiate everything to this level because you can see it's a rising effect. It's a combination of two effects. One from just a collection of ionized electron hole pairs. The hole pairs come to the silicon-silicon dioxide boundaries. Sorry to get a bit technical, but that creates an electric field that causes an increased leakage current. But we can also break the bonds at the silicon-silicon dioxide boundary, which will trap additional electrons and go against this. So we actually ship these off uh, to be pre-irradiated to break those bonds so that when we start them, they start right here and they don't have this irradiation effect. So we have a lot of cool ways to get rid of it like that. Second question was, are these, these are custom made by the electrical engineering group at Penn, a fantastic group. There are some components that we sort of take, some made by CERN, things that make clocks that need to be radiation hard. Um, and so CERN distributes those components to everybody. Other just pieces of logic, CERN really has this library of radiation hard components you can plug and play in. But beyond that, everything is sort of designed by the engineers at Penn. Yeah, what kind of components do you have inside? Uh, do you have processing units and memory units or analog units, digital units? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have ADC converters. We have temperature monitors. Um, we used to have SRAMs. We got rid of them. We now just have FIFOs, a little smaller, but we could make them the size we wanted. Um, uh, pieces of logic that can make clocks, that can take a reference clock and make other clocks at different frequencies from it. A lot of logic blocks like that. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe time for one more question, given that it's past five. Anybody? Well, maybe, can I ask you one question on the physics? Maybe it would show uh, your uh, Higgs, uh, the Higgs to uh, plus two lepton. Yeah. Uh, no, not this one, but the... Uh, Proceeding. Yeah, yeah, this one. And um, do you have any rough idea of the cross-section number of decays you expect from this model for some, I don't know, charging the masses of uh, 150, 200 uh, GeV? 150 GeV? Ish, yeah. It would be very large. Um, a particle like this of 150 GeV, we would have seen it already. We produce a lot of them. No, um, even in this... Uh, you don't know, right? Because we haven't really looked for this specific decay. If it only decays, uh, if it's a Higgsino like uh, scenario where it only decays by Higgs but doesn't decay to, to the bosons. This constrains it quite a bit, but the cross section for producing this rises rapidly at lower energies. Um, let me see if I have such a figure. Unfortunately, I don't think I do. Um, but at 150 GeV, we would have seen it. We would have seen something, just a huge excess, so that other processes that create multiple Bs, even QCD, wouldn't really make sense down there. So uh, do you have some idea what the reach is going to be in terms of mass for this high level in HC or with this RUN3? Or whatever? For RUN3 is the focus, yeah. Uh, again, it depends on the branching fraction here. 100%, um, I'd expect us to go to maybe about 800 GeV. 900 GeV. Really? Yeah, mass so reach. Yeah. It depends on, on how well we can do this and improve this. Right. With the trilepton resonance, with just the run two data, we were able to get up to about one TeV with that three lepton resonance. So this is going to be a bit but harder. It's, strong production, so it's, uh... it's the same type of production. Oh, it's the same production. It's the same two particles. This one just prefers to decay to a Higgs. This coupling now has a Higgs preference. Before, we looked for this coupling having a Z preference but it's the same exact particle production. Good. Well, let's uh, thank Jeff again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was very yeah, nice. Thanks so much. Uh, this is uh, your laptop, but I guess we could have saved some, some magic way. Okay. So we'll see. I don't know if we have to do anything.
I don't think we need to do anything, but uh, okay, yeah, good. Um, so we have uh, we probably will leave around maybe quarter of six. Sounds uh, perfect. So you could uh, take a you know breathing time, have okay. some water, coffee, whatever you want. Uh, uh, and uh, tell me the situation with the car. Do you have a car or you don't, right? And where are you staying? Which hotel? Hampton Inn. Hampton Inn in the downtown. It's very close to the train station. Okay. So I'll just walk to the train tomorrow. Uh, right. Perfect. So then I guess a couple things. Uh, Kathy asked me to get you a key so that we could leave it. Uh, yes. No, you still need to go it, back right? first. Yes. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, just before we well, go. I'll give it to you. Okay. Right. So we'll just drop it under her door, actually. It's even easier. Okay. And then, uh, so I'll just pick you up maybe quarter off uh, six. <laughs> okay. And then we'll drive to... <clears throat> and do you want to meet at the Hampton Inn, or uh, no, no, just here, just right here. I think okay. it's, it's easy. You'll pick me up from my off from the office. office right? Good. Great. It's five twelve, right? Uh, your office. No, I'll. <laughs> I'll so it's it the last one closest to the elevator, Jeff. <clears throat> no. Oh. It is five twelve, right. but it's right next to yeah. Ulrich's office. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Good. I'll see you there. Don't forget your bag. Yes, thank you. Uh, you do you need a ride today? For, no, no, I've, I've, uh, I have a car. I have a car, so I'll see you there. Yeah. Um, I remember an engineer that uh, I used to work with a pen on a brick van Burn. Rick, yes. Is he still around? He comes and goes. He semi retired before this project, but he's still around. I see him. He's sort of the legend oh, of the engineering kind of... group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he talks with them a lot. Particularly when they're thinking of new exciting projects to work on mm -hmm. at Dune or elsewhere, he, he likes to be involved in thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm always amazed how small it turns out to be, <laughs> and how many people know each other. Are you guys involved in Dune at the Yes, yes. A couple of faculty getting involved in there. Uh, 